Good morning, church family. My name's Luke, and this is my lovely wife, Danielle. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy them themselves food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to the heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves, then gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were, was about 5,000 besides women and children. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this amazing church family and for Pastor Tim. We just ask that you speak through him today, Lord, and uh, whoever needs to hear it, we just ask that you have them trust in you, that you always provide, even through these darkest of times, and just know that you're in control, Lord, and we just thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Man, man, I felt like we could have gone all day on that, huh? If you're a guest with us, I want to welcome you. So glad you're here to worship with us. Would you take that Connect card out that you were handed on the way in uh, and begin to fill it out? If you'd rather fill out a digital Connect card, scan the seat back in front of you or to the you know seat to the side of you. And, uh, and just begin to fill that digital Connect card out. On that Connect card is an area for prayer. We love to come alongside of you and pray. We are a praying people. We better be a praying people. Uh, Lord calls us to pray without ceasing. As we look through Acts, the early church, what do we see? We see the, the church gathering together to pray. And, and so we certainly want to pray for you, with you. And so would you let us know how we, uh, we might do that? And, and thank you for entrusting us to come alongside of you. We say we are discovery because we mean it. It's, it's, the, it's the people of discovery. And so we want to come alongside of you and pray with you and for you. I'm so thankful for Luke and Danielle. Uh, and uh, I'm so thankful for how the Lord works and he moves. And um, I've just, it's just been, been hitting me uh, so clearly lately. You stay somewhere long enough and you begin to form uh, relationships. And what the Lord does is he brings people back at different times full circle into your life. And that's exactly what the Lord has done with, with Luke and Danielle. I asked them at the 9 a.m. how long they've been married, uh, how many days. And, um, but uh, how, many, how, how long have y'all been married? Five months. Five months. Okay, five months they've been married. Can we, can we praise God for, for marriage? And... Um, uh, when I served, uh, before we planted Discovery, I served as a, a kids and worship pastor, and uh, Luke was in the youth uh, group, and, um, and he was a gangster, and so, uh, or, or, or at least a wannabe gangster, and uh, now he's probably more of a gangster than wannabe, for sure. Uh, you can hear his testimony at another time, but, but the Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful for what the Lord is doing in his life, in the challenge to lead his home, and I'm so thankful that in God's grace, grace, great grace that he would provide a bride uh, in Danielle for you. I, I mean that. I'm so thankful. And I look across and I'm just, I just continue to see God's hand of favor in, in, in the lives of his people. And I'm so thankful that, uh, that we were able five months ago to stand in this backyard, in this backyard, and the wind was howling. We were checking, you know, to see if the rain was coming. And, uh, and it was like, hey, if the rain comes, it comes, right? We were like, we were ready to go. It was, it was go time. And, uh, and I started the ceremony by just simply saying that this is just a, such a beautiful picture of marriage and life. Because so many times we want to make sure everything is perfect. And, and by the way, it, some, some of those that are engaged in the house or online, you're waiting for the perfect moment. There's never a perfect moment. You're trying to save up thinking I'll get there, I'll be ready one day. No, you won't. 
trust me, uh, there's never a perfect moment other than if the, when the Spirit of God moves and he allows, right, he allows that, that, that not to be t- uh, tied. And, and, uh, and so it, it's, it's go time. And so just follow the Spirit of God. But we're, we're standing here on this, the, the backyard and it was like so beautiful, man. And I, I, I've done a, I can't tell you how many weddings I've done, but I mean, hairs everywhere and, and uh, things are just blowing off. And uh, I mean, it's just, it was such a beautiful picture, though, how life is, is, is crazy and it's messy and it's challenging. And that's what we're in this teaching series called Ministry, Welcome to the Mess, because if you think for one moment that, that ministry, and by the way, we're all ministers of the gospel. You've been called to be ambassadors for the sake of the gospel. You have a ministry. Majority of you will never stand on a platform here, nor do, do you qualify to stand on a platform here, and that's okay. God is calling us as the church, those sons and daughters, to go and to be ministers of the gospel, ministers of reconciliation. He's calling uh, us to do that. And so life is messy. Life is messy. You consider your life and the challenges that you faced even recently. It's messy. It's messy. I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 14 with me. Matthew chapter 14. The main idea that we're going to press in on today is that only Jesus can satisfy our needs. I want you to hear clearly, and the text is going to reveal this to us, and I believe the Spirit of God will connect it all together, that only Jesus can satisfy our needs. We're we're, we're living in times where people are looking all around for the needs to be met, and there's only one person that can truly meet them, and his name is Jesus. Verse 13, Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. Pause for a moment. When Jesus heard about it, what did he hear about? If you were with us last week for part one of this teaching series, we looked at how John the Baptist has just been beheaded. This is John the Baptist who was the forerunner of Jesus. This is John the Baptist who boldly boldly proclaimed, repent, the kingdom of heaven is near. This is John the Baptist that laid the groundwork for then Jesus to come onto the scene and the the disciples to be called and the early church to, to be formed. This is John the Baptist who's been in prison because he was willing to stand up against Herod Antipas And say, no, what you've done is wrong. You illegally divorced your wife. You've gone after your brother's wife. That's crazy in itself. That's wrong in itself. Ventured this relationship. Herod Antipas didn't like that. Throws John the Baptist in jail. A couple years later, they're having this party. There's this festival. And what Herodias won't, she gets. Herod Antipas had started down a track has started out a trek that I really believe began with his father. They're having this party, sinful party. Herodias' daughter is going to dance the sexual dance. But before they make this agreement, I'll dance if the mom had been in her ear. If you bring John the Baptist's head on a platter. He doesn't want to necessarily, but he does. Here comes John the Baptist's head on a platter. How diabolical is that, by the way? Here's his head on a platter. She does the dance. The disciples come and pick up his body, take it, bury his body, and go tell Jesus about what had just happened. Verse 13, when Jesus heard about it. He had heard about this. He withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. When the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the towns. We talked last week about there are times that we need to pause. We need to pause to rest. When we're experiencing loss and grief, when we're tired, the best thing we can do is to not keep running, to not keep moving, but to simply rest in the presence of God. I don't know. There's some that might be running here today. 
You're tired. You've experienced some, some loss, some grief, some transition, some, some challenges, some mountains are staring at you. Can I encourage you to go home today and rest? Rest. One of the greatest ministry leadership principles I, I believe we see here is the example of our Savior Jesus withdrawing from ministry. He's not going to heal because he's going to get in a boat. He's going to go in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and work his way from, from, from uh, uh, one area crossing over to the other side. And so he's going to land in the north eastern part of the Sea of Galilee on the shore there. Life is draining. It can be draining. You've experienced it firsthand? People and their problems and you and your problems and <laughs> decisions and uh, struggles of this life can be absolutely draining. And, and I hope some would have ears to hear today that, that, that you need to implement some kind of a Sabbath in your life to rest. I'm thankful at times. I don't like it, but I'm thankful to have a wife uh, that will literally uh, take the phone away or tell me, no, you're not doing this on my Friday because she knows that I need it in order to continue to pastor this, this church and to lead you well. I better be healthy. So I'm thankful for her. Jesus withdrew. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd, verse 14, and had compassion on them and healed their sick. Even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of loss, Jesus looks out at the crowd and has compassion. The crowd follows Jesus. If you've ever been to Israel, you can look at that northern part and you can look across the sea and you can, you can see it clearly. And so they would have seen where Jesus would have gone and so they just made the long route to him. Jesus gets off the boat and what's the first thing that he's filled with is compassion. He looks the crowd over and what does he see? Compassion, all oh, that the church may have the heart of Jesus, that the church might be a compassionate people, that people might see compassion in us. This word compassion in the truest original language means one's bowels being turned within you. I mean, that's what the Greek language speaks to, this word compassion. Oftentimes we hear compassion. Yeah, I got that. No, we, I don't know how often we really have that kind of compassion, you know. Jesus is compassion. He sees the crowd and something within him turns. His inward bowels turn within him. Why? Because he sees people. He sees hurting people. He sees messy people. He sees broken people. He sees hungry people. He sees people in need of a miracle. Oh, that we might have the eyes of Jesus and be used by him. Compassion. Jesus had compassion on them, healed their sick. When the evening came, the disciples approached him. You with me? Verse 15, approached him and said, this place is deserted and it is already late. Send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And, and so the disciples form their little, you know, committee and uh, come up with this idea and bring it to Jesus. And they're like, hey, it's already late. People are hungry. It's past dinner time. We don't have any food. Let's send them away. Let's send them away. I'm thankful that uh, I, I don't always go with my first idea. <laughs> We should seek the counsel of our Savior before we go with any idea. They bring this idea to Jesus. This is their response. Jesus sees compassion. Jesus sees compassion on the crowd, and the disciples just see hunger. <laughs> How are we going to feed all these people? Verse 16, they don't need to go away. Isn't it wonderful as we read through the Gospels that we see time and time again Jesus inviting us in? Same disciples. Parents are bringing their children. They're bringing their children. And what is, there's a roadblock. And what does Jesus say? Bring the children to me. 
Uh, what, what does Jesus say to those that are tired, those that are heavy laden, filled with burdens? What does Jesus say? Come to me. Through the Gospels, we see Jesus inviting us in. They don't need to go away, Jesus. Jesus said, you give them something to eat. I wish I could have been there that day to see the response of the disciples after hearing Jesus. I mean, their idea was to send them away. And what does Jesus say? Give them something to eat. Now, they're not going anywhere. They're staying here. You go give them something to eat. In John's account, verse 6, John chapter 6, verse 6, uh, I'd encourage you to write that reference down, John 6, verse 6. He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. For he himself knew what he was going to do. So Jesus tests the disciples, and this testing is a stretching of faith. I'm thankful for the test of God, even though there's times I don't like the test. Can we just be honest? There's times I don't like the test. God, can you give the test to somebody else? Like, why, you know, why me again? Uh, you know, seven days in a row. Can, and then I get on my own little pity party thinking, I'm the only one with tests. You ever been there? I'm the only one with struggles. And then there's a wake-up call when you have a conversation with somebody that, no, you're not the only one with tests and with, with, with troubles. We're all facing some kind of test. And James tells us that the test, there's a purpose in the test. There's a purpose in the pain. And the purpose is to develop our faith. It's to develop our endurance so that we don't quit, so that we keep on going, so that we continue to shine the light and love of Jesus Christ to a dark, dying world. There's always, there's always, in, in the midst of the test and the trials, God is always doing something. It's always for our development. May we have eyes to see it's for our good rather than instantly think, why me? It's for our bad. Oh, that God would save us from that relationship or save us from that job or save us from that car wreck or whatever it might be or even if we get in all of it, that God would place us because of the car wreck in that hospital room and that we might share Jesus with that nurse or that person that walks by. He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus already knew. The disciples didn't really know who Jesus was and what he was capable of. But he did this to test their faith. I wonder today, how is he testing and stretching your faith? Oh, would you write that down and consider it this afternoon? How is the Lord testing and stretching your faith? Uh, second question is, what task is God calling you to that seems impossible? What task? What is it that he's calling you to that seems impossible? Again, they come to Jesus with this idea, let's send everybody out. Jesus says, no, they don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. Verse 17, but we only have five loaves and two fish. We got five loaves and we got two fish sandwiches. What are we going to do? With two fish sandwiches. They said to him, verse 18, bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. John's account, by the way, all four gospels give this account, this historical and biblical narrative. That all four gospels give us this account. And in John's account, we see that it was Andrew. Andrew says, Jesus, there's a boy here that has five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish. There's this, this, this boy, this boy here. And so, so as a result, the disciples are saying, well, there's about 15,000 to 20,000 people out here. And all we got is two fish sandwiches. I don't know what we're going to do here. And, uh, and so what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? He says this, bring them here to me. Five loaves and two fish reminds us of who really is in control. Five loaves and, and two fish. What are you, you going to do with that? Bring them here to me, Jesus says. I would challenge us 
the tasks that seem impossible before you. Bring to Jesus that which he has entrusted to you. Whatever it is, however much, whatever he's entrusted to you, will you bring it to Jesus? Will you bring it to Jesus? Then he commanded, verse 19, he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. I, I, I love that. I, I love that Matthew allows us to see the visual, right? To see this visual. He commanded them to sit down on the grass as if Jesus is saying, watch what I'm about to do. Hey, all of you that are hungry, you don't have to go to the villages to find food. Take a seat. Get ready because I'm about to come through in a way you never expected. Oh, what Jesus can do with a young boy's five loaves of bread and two fish. Oh, that Discovery Church might be found faithful in raising up, pouring into the younger generation that we might even look to them as an encouragement to, to us. But oh, what God can do with a young boy's two fish and five loaves of bread. I was so proud the other day, Audra told me, I didn't share this in the first because my daughter was sitting here in the front row, in the second row, and she's not here today. She's back there, I'm assuming, serving. And she said, uh, they were out. Maybe I'm getting the daughters wrong. Any parents ever do that? You know, you call all the kids' names. And <laughs> one of our daughters found a dime, and the other, the other one said, the other one said, uh, I, I, I got to tie the penny <laughs> from that dime. Oh, I just, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for, for children that, that are understanding and learning the importance of what it means to, to give, even, every, even what we find on the ground. <laughs> um, I'm thankful for the, the heart that's being developed. And I know that's the heart of Pastor Mike, our family pastor. That's the heart of our Discovery Kids uh, leaders and teachers. And I'm so thankful that even now as we're opening up God's word, they are teaching your children, some of your children, what it means to follow Jesus and live for him. They're teaching the gospel of Jesus. They're explaining the gospel of Jesus. I'm thankful. May we continue to be a church that has a heart for the younger generation and that we'll do everything we can to raise them up and invest in and to them. He commanded the crowds to sit down. Verse 19, you with me? He took the five loaves and two fish Looking up to heaven, he blessed them, he broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. What's he do? The first thing he does, he looks up to heaven, he blesses, and he breaks. I, I would encourage each of us, I, I was taught from a very young age that we pray before we eat, and and I didn't quite understand till I was a little older why we're praying before we eat, although I've heard the prayers and, you know, especially the memorized ones. And, uh, and so quite often around our dinner table, we're, we're going to pause. And if it sounds like people, like girls, are, are, we're just going through the motions or because we're hungry and we want to eat, now we're going to pause and we're going to redo it. We're going to do a redo. <laughs> I would encourage you and your home to do the same. Why? Because... Are we truly thankful for the daily provision that's before us, acknowledging that the food that's before me is a gift from God, that everything that I have is, 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 has been given by God. He's entrusted it to me, the food that's before me. So thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Jesus looks up to heaven as he takes the five loaves and the two fish. He looks up to heaven. He looks up to heaven. He blesses and he breaks. Verse 20, everyone, everyone ate. Everyone ate and was satisfied. Can you imagine 15 to 20,000 people? 5,000 men plus children and women. 15 to 20,000 people eating that day. Everyone ate and was satisfied. It wasn't like you got a half of a fish sandwich. You got the whole thing. Everyone ate and was satisfied. 
They picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. Now those who ate were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Verse 20 tells us everybody ate and were satisfied. Only Jesus can satisfy. Only Jesus can satisfy. Everyone ate. Then the same disciples that gathered, you know, in this huddle and came up with this idea, presented it to Jesus saying, let's tell them all to leave. Jesus said, no. This young boy steps up. I got five loaves of bread. I have two fish. Jesus takes them, looks up to heaven, blesses and breaks them. And the same disciples that wanted to scatter everyone out are the very ones that are now distributing what Jesus has just multiplied. And don't miss this. After everyone was satisfied, the same disciples that had distributed all this food walk around with a basket each. And 12 baskets are filled up, one for each disciple. Don't think for a moment that our God is not sovereign and in control of all things. Don't think for one moment that our God is not good and he's not gracious. Don't think that for one moment that our God is not the God of provision. God of miracles. Psalm 107 verse 8 says this. Would you write that reference down? Psalm 107 verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love and his wondrous works for all humanity. Verse 9. For he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. He has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. Uh, quickly, the feeding of the 5,000 plus, that's what we'll call it. The feeding of the 5,000 plus gives us uh, two, two principles regarding God's provision. The first, would you write the word thank, thank, thank God for. It's the principle to, that you and I should be thanking God for. Thank God for and wisely use what you have. Don't waste what he gives you. Oh, church, don't waste what he gives you. In a wasteful world, don't waste what he gives you. Thank God for. Thank God for. We see in verse 19, he blessed them. He blessed them. He thanks God for it. The multitudes, listen, the multitudes and the disciples would have never experienced the supernatural power and provision of Jesus that day if that boy didn't offer up this five loaves and two fish. Oftentimes, I believe that we look at our, our life. We look at our lives and we think all I got is five loaves and two fish. All I got is five loaves and two fish. And then we say, Jesus can't do anything with this. But historically, this is what Jesus has always done. Why? To prove that he alone is in control, that he alone can satisfy it, that he alone meets our every needs. When we look to this feeding of the 5,000 plus, we should give thanks to God. We should become more of a thankful people, live lives that exemplify that we are a thankful people. Thank God for and wisely use, steward well what the Lord has given you. I often say, I don't know that it is, I need a, a bigger income per se, problem. I believe that as I have these conversations with people, there's a stewardship problem. We don't steward well what resources we have. And that's why at the end of the month, we're, we're broke. It's because we haven't done things God, God's way. We haven't, we haven't trusted him with the tithe. We haven't put money aside for savings. We don't know what we're spending our money on. We have no budget. We're just following our heart, which will always lead us down the wrong path. So let's steward well. Let's not waste what God has given us. The second 
principle is the word trust. Trust. Trust God's unlimited resources. Trust God's unlimited resources. What does he do? He blesses it and he breaks it. He multiplies it. We serve the God of unlimited resources. What the Lord can do with five loaves and two fish. He's multiplied it again and again in my life and in the life of this church. This is the story of discovery. People said over 16 years ago, November next month will be 16 years since we had our first meeting. 16 years ago, people said, Ah, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. Uh, one man I met with was so encouraging. He said, uh, until you have $100,000 in your bank account, you shouldn't start the church. And can I tell you, we've never had $100,000 in our bank account. <laughs> Over the years, the Lord has taken our five loaves of bread and our two fish, and he has multiplied it again and again and again and again, and he will continue to again and again and again. Why? For his glory. For his glory. Only Jesus can satisfy. All the, all the people were fed. So they were satisfied. You know, we're living in, well, you know the times we're living in. People are looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. There was an article in New York Times, not that I read New York Times, but in, in my research it just popped up and so... But the overall suicide, this article stated that the overall suicide rate has increased by about 35% over the last two decades. 35%. And you can, you can look out and, and, and you know stories, you know friends, you know family members. But why? Why? Because people are looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. They're, they're looking in all the wrong places. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is the only one that can satisfy they're, they're looking at it in, in satisfaction in a, in a relationship, in a job, in this drug, uh, in a home, or whatever the thing is. And only Jesus, only Jesus can satisfy. Did you know that the chief mode of transportation 2,000 years ago was the same as 200 years ago? Listen to this, this blew my mind. 2,000 years ago, the same as 200 years ago. We've gone from horseback to rocket ship with, within two centuries. We have more information, greater technology at our fingertips than ever before. And you wonder, what's the result? What's the result? We're sick, we're scared, we're emotionally drained. Jumping from broken relationship to broken relationship in a society that is coming apart at the seams. Nathan Guy says this, we still have holes in our souls and we can't seem to fill them. Only Jesus can satisfy. I want to challenge those that are in the house, those that are online today. I want to challenge us to surrender to Jesus in order to experience lasting satisfaction. If you've been with Discovery for a while, you'll hear surrender come out of our mouth just about every gathering because I believe that's what we got. I mean, that's what we bring to the table, surrender. I would challenge you today, no matter where you find yourself, surrender to Jesus in order to experience lasting satisfaction. John chapter 6, verse 35 John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Now, within context, Jesus had just fed the 5,000 plus. That group of people had just witnessed a miracle before their eyes. Not just witnessed it, they tasted it. I mean, tasted it. And then Jesus says, I 
and the bread of life. David Gusek said, the people are hungry. Listen, the people are hungry, and the empty relation, uh, uh, religionist, religionist offers them some ceremony or empty words that can never satisfy. The people are hungry, and the atheist and skeptics try to convince them that they aren't hungry at all. The people are hungry, and the religious showman gives them video and special lighting and cutting-edge music. The people are hungry, and the entertainer gives them loud, fast action, so loud and fast that they don't have a moment to think. The people are hungry. Who will give them the bread of life? Who will give them the bread of life? Listen, Jesus is calling you, and he's calling me. He's calling us to give people the bread of life, to give people what their soul is longing for, to point people to the only one that can satisfy King Jesus. And the answer is, will you answer the call? Will you answer the call? In a world of fading dreams, plastic people, we long for something real. To satisfy our longing, listen, Jesus says, I am. In a world of atrocities and injustice, we long for fairness. To satisfy our longing, Jesus says, I am the way. In a world of fairy tales and lies, oh, we long for truth. To satisfy our longing, Jesus says, I am the truth. In a world of glamorizing, senseless activities, we long for meaning and significance to satisfy our longing. Jesus says, I am the life. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? all across this place. Would you just get alone with the living God? Would you consider your life? Consider perhaps part of your life that you're still holding on to. Maybe you yet to surrender. Is there any part of your life that you have yet to surrender, believer? Proverbs says, my son, give me your whole heart. Uh, maybe you're looking for satisfaction in the wrong places, and today, today you would, you would come to Jesus, surrender to Jesus, that he might meet and fill every void in your life as believers are praying all across this place in the house and online I wonder if there's one here today that's never surrendered over to Jesus today would be the day of salvation for you today would be the day of salvation for you you wonder why you've been wrestling with, with, with this thinking about this why you're even here today, the Spirit of God, I am convinced is at work. And would you say yes to him today so that he might change your life for all eternity? If that's you, as people are praying all across this place and online, if that's you today, would you reach out and receive the greatest gift that has ever been offered, the gift of salvation? Would you say, Jesus I am a sinner and you are the Savior. I repent of my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe in you. You walked this earth, crucified on a cross, placed in a grave, and you rose victorious for me, for the world. And today I receive the gift of salvation. Thank you for saving me. If that's you, would you thank him for saving you? 
in a minute, there's going to be men and women. If you're in the house, there's going to be men and women that are going to be in the different corners. They're going to stand in these different corners as we sing this song. And, and I would encourage you and challenge you, if the Spirit of God is moving in your life, to step out of your seat and, and come as we sing, to come to one of these brothers and sisters, men with men and ladies with ladies. If you're online, there's a host that would love to connect with you. But if you've received Christ today, the gift of salvation, would you pray for you and just celebrate? I believe your first step is to tell somebody, tell somebody what Jesus Christ has done. Perhaps you've been, been looking the, diff- the wrong places to satisfy the, the voids in your life, and today you want to commit to, to Jesus. Would you have the courage to step out of your seat and allow a brother or sister to pray for you? Allow somebody to pray for you, pray for strength for you, pray for you to keep your eyes on Jesus. And maybe there's one here today that's, that you're heavy laden. You're sensing a burden. You're concerned or confused. Would you be honest before God? In his, in our weakness, he's made strong. And so, Lord Jesus, now, would you move? Would you move? However you want to move, move. Lord, take some from complacency to following you, Christ. Take some that are comfortable to following you, Christ. Take some that are just spectators to serve you, Christ. Take us and use us for your glory. But I got to believe in a... In a setting like this, there's some... That they're in, there's great needs. And I pray that they would turn to you, the one who can meet every need. The one who comes through after day with miracles and blessings and so Jesus we say thank you we commit this time to you we move as the spirit of God leads right here right now in this place we ask this in your name Jesus